Hello and welcome to the National Complete Streets Coalition's webinar series, Complete Streets 301, Putting People First. You can join us and our special guests each month for a new topic related to creating streets and places that put people first. Thank you for joining us today for today's webinar, co-hosted by Smart Growth America, the National Complete Streets Coalition, and Trust for America's Health. My name is Emily Schwiniger. I have recently joined the team here at Smart Growth America as the Deputy Director of Thriving Communities. A little background on me, I'm a public health professional with over 12 years of experience uh, from research to implementation with a national and global focus. And I've worked over the years in health equity, health system strengthening, social behavior change communication, and other topics. I'm excited at this moment to be working here at this intersection of health and the built environment. And the National Complete Streets Coalition, a program of Smart Growth America, is a nonprofit, nonpartisan alliance of public interest organizations and transportation professionals committed to the development and implementation of Complete Streets policies and practices. A nationwide movement launched by the coalition in 2004, Complete Streets is the integration of people and places in the planning, design, construction, operation, and maintenance of transportation networks. So just a little bit about our work at the National Complete Streets Coalition. We have to date over 1,500 policies uh, across the country, and you can see the map um, that we have, uh, we've hit a lot of spots. Uh, we are currently working also uh, at the federal level to pass the Complete Streets Act of 2019. So Complete Streets, uh, for those who are fresh to the concept, are a tool to improve our community's health. The National Complete Streets Coalition is building a tool that actually measures the impact that a Complete Streets project can have on a community. And this tool is geared towards local transportation planners, health department officials, advocacy organizations, and others that might find it useful in the planning process. We've been working with the CDC to build this tool, and we've been looking at five impact categories safety, environment, economy, health, and equity. And really looking at equity as a lens to measure safety, environment, economy, and health. So just a, a general overview of the health benefits of complete streets. Um, you know, it's been measured, the opportunities for physical activity that complete streets provide, the cleaner air, air quality issues, and fewer traffic crashes, traffic safety, fewer pedestrian uh, deaths or injuries. And there's different ways that this has been measured. Um, one of the, the more sort of uh, sound measurement tools or methods is the integrated transport and health impact model, ITHM. Um, and there are things that can be measured uh, using metrics for, for example, reduction of disability adjusted life years, um, which would be results of improving the air quality, increasing physical activity, and improving traffic safety. So connecting physical inactivity and chronic disease. Uh, in this webinar, we're going to talk at much greater depth about obesity specifically, uh, but just to, to show you on the map, you can see the southern United States is largely car dependent. Um, and you can see, you know, making that, a, you, you can see if you overlay that over what you see that you have more inactivity and you have higher levels of diabetes. Uh, and, you know, this ties into, you know, post-World War II, you know, the expansion of the highway system and how that's, that's increased obesity in, in our country over the past decades. So complete street give people an opportunity for physical activity. Even if you're riding on uh, transit, there's the first mile, last mile, uh, walking to and from. You know, there's using, obviously, bicycles. You can see this lovely bike path along the highway, uh, which may be more recreational, but also could be used to connect destinations. And of course, a great bike rack on the top, in front of the bus, which can also sort of marry different types of transportation um, and so, you know, Complete Streets give people the freedom to use active transportation options for everyday trips as well as recreation. 
and this increases physical activity. However, in order to have that option, we need safer streets for people. And as you can see in this image, you know, we have this enormous highway. Um, just, you know, you don't see, you see a crosswalk pretty far away. It's not near the bus stop. You see these desire lines or desire paths where, you know, people want a sidewalk. And you can imagine, uh, you know, if you were rolling, if you were in a wheelchair or other sort of obstacles you would have to use this bus stop that you see in front of you. Um, so we need, to, we need to think about how to build into these neighborhoods that have been underinvested in. So in this slide, you can see a graph that shows us how the pedestrian fatalities have been steadily increasing. And unfortunately, what we see is that 2016 and 17 were the most deadly years since 1990. This is information that we share biannually in our uh, signature report, Dangerous by Design. Um, and it's really important, um, this information, we're also, we're not just sharing the sort of aggregate number of pedestrian deaths, but we, you know, use the opportunity to break it into the disaggregated information around, you know, income level, race, um, and then, you know, we can break it into looking at different states and congressional districts to see where these are, accidents are happening more. And it's been a great tool for us to focus our efforts in specific areas uh, where we see there's more of a need. Because we build roads like this one that you see, uh, you know, this image is not, um, it's, it's upsetting. There's a woman with a child. She's running across the street. You can see she's pulling on his arm. She's clearly in a hurry. She wants to make sure that they're going to get to safety. And you can see, you know, the street wasn't built for them. The street was built for those cars. Um, safe infrastructure like crosswalks would make a huge difference here. Um, you see that there's a crosswalk between the sidewalk on the side street, but you don't know how far this person would have to walk up or down the hill to cross at an intersection safely. And again, in the image that we saw previously, sometimes those crosswalks are not placed conveniently in front of transit. And then, you know, one of the things that uh, has been, you know, researched and, and shared um, is the systemic disparities, which is clearly something that we, we find, uh, you know, very important and we need to continue to look at this for example, um, what you see in this graph is that, you know, number of percentage of neighborhoods with sidewalks, 89% are high income neighborhoods versus 49% low income that have sidewalks. And then for lighting, it's 75% versus 51. We have crosswalks, 13% versus 7%. And finally, traffic calming measures are 8% versus 3%. So you see clear disparities between high-income neighborhoods, low-income neighborhoods. And that, again, is reflected in uh, the data that we have, the data that we have with uh, Dangerous by Design and who's actually being struck and killed. And so here we see people die while, walk, while walking at much higher rates in low-income communities. This is, again, um, what we're, we're able to, you know, use census tract median household income um, and compare it with the pedestrian fatalities. And what you see, again, is, um, you know, that as income goes down, you know, fatalities go up. And so the same inequities map on to obesity rates. Uh, which Trust for America's Health highlighted in their new report, The State of Obesity, and they will be talking about uh, a little bit more. So with that, I would like to introduce Trust for America's Health. And we have with us, we're very excited to have with us, uh, presenting on Complete Streets for Better Health, Del Daphne Delgado and Adam Lustig. Uh, so Daphne Delgado is the Senior Government Relations Manager focusing on chronic disease prevention and control priorities, including obesity, physical activity, nutrition, health care financing, and public health funding. Uh, prior to joining, Daphne advocated on behalf of community-based organizations, 
the YMCA of the USA, and for patients and caregivers at the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. Additionally, she was the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute Graduate Health Fellow for Representative Lucille Robal Alas, uh, a Democrat out of California, where she managed the passage of the Newborn Screening Reauthorization Act and introduction of the Health Equity and Accountability Act, among other accomplishments. Additionally with us, uh, we are happy to have Adam Lustig, as I said. He is the manager of promoting health and cost control in states at Trust for America's Health. And the initiative seeks to promote the adoption and implementation of effective evidence-based state public health policies in a relatively short period of time of five years. Prior to joining, he was the senior manager of health systems transformation at the National Network of Public Health Institutes where he developed strategies related to improving healthcare systems, alternative payment models, and supporting people-centered health systems. Mr. Lustig has also held positions at the advisory board company, the National Pharmaceutical Council, and the University of Pennsylvania. He received his MS in health policy from the Thomas Jefferson Co University College of Population Health and a BA in public policy from the State University of New York at Albany. At this point, I would like to hand over uh, the webinar to Daphne Delgado and let her take it from here. Thanks, Emily, and uh, thank you to everyone on the phone for joining us today. Um, we're very excited to um, have a few minutes with you this afternoon. Um, as Emily said, I'm Daphne Delgado, and I work at Trust for America's Health. Um, for, you, for everyone on the phone who is unfamiliar with TIFA, um, Trust for America's Health is a nonpartisan public health policy, research, and advocacy organization. Um, we're mostly dedicated to promoting the health of all communities and working to make prevention of illness and injury a national priority. Some of the issues that we work on um, include areas like Emily said, chronic disease and obesity, which is what I cover. We also um, cover substance misuse, emergency preparedness, aging, um, vaccine access, and more, um, including all the stuff that Adam will talk about in his presentation. And we do this all through a lens of prioritizing prevention and health equity. Um, part of what we do is that we release a series of reports um, and the state of obesity is a report that we release every single year. Um, we release the 2019 version at the end of September, and it's our 16th annual edition, um, which we jointly release um, with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, all of this is available on our web website at tifa.org, and there will uh, also be a slide at the very end with a link, so when you get the slides after the presentation, you can look at that too. So I'm just going to give a quick recap of what is new in the 2019 report, and then Adam will really go into more of a focus on uh, the specifics of how this relates to Complete Streets. So I think the major news is that obesity rates are still climbing. Um, on the left hand of the screen, you'll see two lines. The red line is the adult obesity rate. Um, the yellow line is for children ages 2 to uh, 19. Um, there was a leveling off for a few years, but that is no longer the case, and obesity rates are continuing to rise. Um, I think something that's really important to note that you can see on the map on the right hand side is that for the very first time in 2018, there were nine states that had an adult obesity rate of 35% or more. Um, that's in 2018, there were nine states. In 2012, there were zero states. So we are seeing, a, you know, we are seeing, again, this increase. Um, I've met with several congressional offices that, um, you know, give a sigh of relief when they're not one of the nine States, but I have to remind them that just because they may technically be on the lower end, they are still worse off than they were 10 or even five years ago. Um, everyone is increasing. Um, and it's just important to note that while these numbers I'm presenting are just on obesity, uh, over half of adults in every single state are either overweight or have obesity. So that's just something to keep in mind. I think another important st 
statistic, again, to really highlight how quickly obesity has been increasing in the past two decades is in the year 2000, West Virginia was the most obese state with an adult obesity rate of 23.9%. In 2018, Colorado was the least obese state with a rate of 23%. So in just 18 years, the ceiling has become the floor. So we are on track to have the thinnest state have an obesity uh, rate surpass the most obese state in just less than two decades. While this is our 16th year doing the report, this is the very first year where we have a special section where we go really in depth into a specific um, um, audience of obesity. And this year, we have a special section that really focused on the racial and ethnic disparities in obesity and uh, intentionally included policy approaches to advancing health equity. So obesity levels are highest in African American and Latino communities. These communities are more likely to be in neighborhoods with fewer options for healthy foods and safe physical activity. And they are also the target of widespread marketing of unhealthy foods. Um, just for sake of timing, I'm not gonna go into all of the numbers, but again, this is all um, available in the report on our website and you are more than, have, uh, more than welcome to email me afterwards if you want anything specific. Um, but I think the important thing to note, too, is we have to recognize that poverty and institutional racism and their community context shape the daily life and choices available for healthy food and safe physical activity. So we have to understand these geographic, racial, ethnic, education, income inequities. Um, these are really important to recognize these in order to come up with policy approaches that actually can help our communities. Um, very quickly, some trends in childhood obesity. Um, like adults, the number of children with obesity is rising. In 2016, which is the year that we have the most recent data, 18.5% of children had obesity, which is the highest rate ever documented since um, CDC started tracking this in 1976. Um, the childhood obesity rates have more than tripled in that time. It's, childhood obesity is incredibly important uh, to preventing obesity because um, preventing, sorry, preventing obesity is much easier than trying to reverse the trend later on. So it, that is why you'll see so many policies and programs that are really focused at the school and preschool level, um, really trying to get to that prevention piece. Um, some multiple consequences of obesity. So 100 million adults, around 40% of the U.S., have prediabetes or diabetes, um, uh, type 2 diabetes, I should say. Um, but obesity also increases the risk of other chronic disease, like high blood pressure, heart disease and stroke, arthritis, certain types of cancer, um, et cetera. Economically, $215 billion every single year is dedicated to either annual medical expenses related to obesity or reduced economic productivity, which is things like people calling out sick for work, um, things like that. Um, obesity among baby boomers is also going to exacerbate long-term health care costs as they start to age into Medicare. Medicare and Medicaid will start to um, are dealing with the brunt of this right now, and they, that is expected to rise as baby boomers age into Medicare. Um, Adam is gonna go into a little bit more detail into the specific consequences of not enough physical activity later on. I want to touch very quickly on the context of how the federal government um, does this work. So in FY19, CDC's budget, and CDC is one of the major public health agencies in this country. It's not the only one, but it is probably the biggest. Um, in FY19, CDC's total budget was $7.3 billion. While that may seem like a big number, it's important to note that in 2017, all of public health spending, of which 
CDC is just a part of, represented just 2.5% of all health spending in this country. So very little of the health spending that we have in this country is actually outside the walls of a healthcare system, going to things that could prevent people to have to go into the healthcare system in the first place. Um, accounting for inflation, CDC's budget has fallen by around 10% over the past decade. And while the budget has fallen or not kept pace, there, the country's public health needs and emerging threats have continued to rise. There's been a rise in substance misuse and chronic disease, uh, weather-related emergencies where emergency preparedness is needed. So CDC is being asked to do more and more every day with fewer resources. Um, this is just a slide that I think kind of can put things into perspective. Like I said, CDC's budget of $7.3 billion may seem big, but this is CDC's budget for everything the agency does, whether it's vaccines or cancer screenings or outbreak detection of things like Ebola and E. coli and the vaping illnesses we're seeing now. Um, injury prevention, like tracking unintentional deaths due to car crashes, um, overdoses, HIV and STD prevention, and chronic disease prevention. That's everything. In this slide, the 31 cents per person is the money CDC allocates to its division of nutrition, physical activity, and obesity divided by um, the number of people in the country. Compare that the right side of the screen, where in a single year, the food industry spent $9 billion in advertising to minority kids. This $9 billion isn't even the total of all food advertising. This is just a number that is specifically targeting black and Hispanic children. The vast majority of that um, funding is for junk food advertising. So how should we respond? Again, a lot of this is in the report. There's a whole section of recommendations, and I'm more than happy to speak with anyone one-on-one -on -one afterwards um, about anything that you may find interesting. But some of the major recommendation themes in our report are prevention is key. It's easier to prevent um, obesity than try to reverse trends later on. Progress requires funding evidence-based strategies in order to bring them to scale. Um, Funding for comprehensive and long-term approaches that promote healthy eating and physical activity are key. Um, and that these approaches are never going to live in any one industry or sector or agency. It's really going to require every, um, all hands on deck. And that it's imperative that efforts focus on populations that bear a disproportionate burden of obesity first, not afterwards. Um, these last two points are really especially important since obesity is a chronic disease in its own right, but it's also sim obesity is also symptomatic and responsive to broader equity issues like poverty and institutional racism. So all of these recommendations need to be done in the context of how all of these sectors can come together. Um, since obesity is sensitive to these social determinants of health, community and policy solutions must thoughtfully reflect that. Um, if you just provide healthy food to a community, but they're foods that they're not familiar with, they don't know how to cook them, they don't, um, they don't have time to cook them, they can't access them because they're expensive, um, or they feel unsafe going to get them in the first place, uh, because they don't have access to transportation or it's unsafe to walk at night in their neighborhoods to the market. These are all things that would be done outside of the healthcare system, but that deeply affect someone's health. Um, so solutions that span multiple categories, like the ones shown on this chart, um, can lead to better and more equitable outcomes. And it's important to focus on social determinants um, and know the difference between social determinants and social needs. There have been a lot of great strides in having the healthcare sector focus on social needs. Um, many doctors screen patients by asking questions like, do you know where your next meal is coming from? Or do you live in a safe place? And some of those doctors may even refer patients to 
social services. Um, but while that's a great start, it's not enough. We need to ensure that the social services on the other side are actually coordinated and well-resourced. If we're going to increase the demand for these social services, we need to make sure that the supply is ready um, to go. Um, we can't just build half the bridge. Um, so again, if we only focus, focus on that first half of doctors screening and referring patients one by one, um, that's really getting at social needs. It's not addressing social determinants by changing the underlying systemic conditions. Um, so while many of you may or may not see yourself as part of the health system, you are. Um, we need an all-population approach broader than any single health system or payer. So he, these are some of the recommendations in the report. Um, some have to do with active transportation, some don't. Um, some are uh, related to CDC, like expanding CDC's state physical activity and nutrition program to all states. Right now, CDC only receives enough funding to have um, span in 16 states, and a lot of state health departments are using their money to implement multi-sector campaigns that could include complete street strategies. Um, increase CDC's REACH. reach grant, um, the REACH program grants local community organizations to deliver local culturally appropriate obesity-related programs, and many grantees have focused efforts on prioritizing complete street implementation as well. Um, we also have things in there about SNAP, which is also known as food stamps, and WIC, um, support for low-income families and individuals. We also have quite a few recommendations that um, ask Congress and state policymakers to prioritize safe, active transportation options in all transportation reauthorization efforts, like um, the Transportation Alternative Program, which is a major source of federal funding for safe routes to school, biking, walking projects, things like that. Um, and we also recommend that um, the U.S. Department of Transportation should add Safe Routes to School, Vision Zero, Complete Streets, and non-infrastructure projects as eligible initiatives of the Highway Safety Improvement Program. Um, if this happened, this would allow for more types of biking, walking, and rolling projects to qualify for 100% federal funding without a state match requirement. So I just wanted to highlight um, one specific CDC initiative that uh, I thought some of you may be interested in. So in 2017, CDC began Active People Healthy Nation. The official launch is next month with a congressional briefing. So if you're in the DC area and are interested, let me know and I can forward you the briefing information. But basically, Active People Healthy Nation um, this is CDC's initiative to help 27 million Americans become more physically active by 2027. Um, right now, CDC recognizes that many people want to get physical activity, but live in communities that lack safe, convenient places for people of all ages and abilities to be active. Um, one of the things that I found most astounding in the Active People Healthy Nation materials is that less than half of the U.S. population lives within one half mile of a park, and that only 40% of school-aged children live a mile or less from the school, but that, the, but that they actually walk to school. Um, so um, again, the 27 million more Americans more physically active by 2027 um, these are all, uh, CDC has broken down the number that they want to get a certain amount, some certain number of people um, where they're doing zero minutes to something, where those people who are doing something to the physical activity guidelines recommendation of 150 minutes per week. So there's a place for everyone to improve their numbers. Um, if this is um, so these are all of the different strategies that Active People Healthy Nation is going to provide 
communication materials on and ways to get involved. But the first one that they're starting with in the launch in January of 2020 is active friendly, activity friendly routes to everyday destinations. Um, so you'll see that complete streets is included in this. So um, on the right hand of the screen, you'll see just a sample material of what Active People Healthy Nation puts out. But there's a wealth of resources on the site that um, will connect people um, to how to do this in their community. So if you're more, if you're interested in CDC's initiative of Active People Healthy Nation, these are the sites of where you can find more information. Um, and with that, I am going to hand it off to Adam. Great. Thanks so much, Daphne. And uh, thank you to, to Smart Growth America for hosting us today. Uh, I'm Adam Lustig. I am the manager of the Promoting Health and Cost Control in States Initiative here at the Trust for America's Health. Uh, given the initiative that I just said is a mouthful, I'll be referring to it as facts going forward. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the FACTS initiative um, and then specifically talk about um, the role that Complete Streets plays in, in the work that I lead. So the FACTS initiative um, focuses on state-level policies that promote health and control cost growth or promote um, any type of revenue generation for states. One specific aspect of this initiative is specifically related to looking at policies that are outside of the healthcare system. What we're really trying to do is trying to open up either state decision makers, key advocates, and other stakeholders' minds to that health is really more than healthcare, and the environments for which we live play a significant role in the health of all individuals. In our work, we did a thorough evidence review and identified 13 evidence-based state policies that can be enacted that have demonstrated health and economic impact. As you can see on this slide, we, I've listed all of the 13 policies, and you can see our seventh policy here is complete streets. Looking through this list of policies, you'll really see that we try, with this list, we tried a set of policies that address individuals um, life course, so for, through the early childhood education, such as universal pre-K, to older Americans with housing rehabilitation loan and grant programs, which are often geared towards older Americans. Again, you'll see that all of these are outside of the healthcare system, really trying to further emphasize the importance that policy plays in the health of all individuals. So I'm not going to go into too much detail here in terms of what is Complete Streets, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with them. Um, and we were very grateful for all of the tremendous resources that SGA has available on their website, as we cited many of them in our own work. One thing that I would just like to highlight here on this slide, um, and based on the uh, data that Emily had presented earlier, is that looking through the GHSA data, um, they have made a projection for the 2018 pedestrian fatalities, um, and it's actually higher than in years past. And so um, the projection is for 6,227 pedestrian fatalities, which is the highest since 1990, and after many years of progress through the 90s and early 2000s. I'll even say on a personal level, um, this is something that's impacted me and my community where I live in Montgomery County, Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C., where there have already been nine pedestrian fatalities in 2019, many of which occurred just within a single mile of my own home. Um, so as Daphne shared, I'm going to uh, briefly go over what are some of the, the benefits of complete streets policies and then run through a couple examples of uh, effective complete street policies and uh, some of the key aspects related to them. So we, just, uh, we determined that complete streets would be one of our 13 policies because there is a significant and robust evidence base supporting um, improved health outcomes as a result of these policies. People who use active transportation are, on average, more physically fit, less obese, 
and have a reduced risk of cardiovascular disease compared to people who only use motorized transportation. And the shift from motorized transportation to active transportation has the potential for societal benefits, such as reduced emissions of air pollutants and greenhouse gases, reduced traffic noise, and more livable neighborhoods with less motor vehicle traffic. Something that's really important to highlight, though, is as we need to recognize that active transportation does have its own set of risks, and this is where complete streets really comes into play. With an increase in pedestrian and non-automobile uh, streetscape designs, um, we're paying special attention to how complete streets and other complementary policies can play a role, especially as metropolitan areas look to explore new micro-transit um, options, such as the expansion of e-scooter programs, which is something that we're uh, currently experiencing in Washington, D.C. On the economic side, um, there's often arguments made um, against complete streets policies that they are costly, but when looking at it comprehensively, they are in line with other types of infrastructure programs. Cost for infrastructure improvements can vary significantly both by um, locale and the type of improvement. So for example, the median cost um, for a striped sidewalk is about $340 which is um, six, uh, $16 per linear feet for an asphalt sidewalk and about um, $90,000 per mile for a bike lane. Compared to other type of infrastructure design, these are in line and we, and we believe that this is an option that state and local decision makers should consider as they um, consider new planning options uh, for their own communities. Additionally, street, street cap Streetscape design improvements typically have a lower cost per mile than the cost per mile for an average new arterial street project. So um, one thing that I um, found interesting is that um, there was a survey done in 2015 um, that looked at how metropolitan planning organizations viewed complete streets. And despite the evidence showing that health and economic impacts of complete street policies there's, been, there's still been rather slow adoption. Um, this national survey found that while there is widespread knowledge and adoption of complete street policies, they have not been widely implemented. This is due to a variety of reasons, but the most cited issue was a lack of political will and cost. Interestingly, this barrier may not actually exist, but may be perceived as a barrier, thus preventing MPOs and other organizations and stakeholders from adopting these policies. Um, and then interestingly enough, despite the significant public health implications of complete streets policies, as I just went over and what Emily and Daphne also cited, only about 20% of the MPOs surveyed um, in this 2015 survey said that the public health improvements is an explicit goal of their policies. Now I'm going to walk through a couple examples of not only the impact of complete street policies in specific communities, but the important role of bringing together a diverse set of stakeholders to support these policies. So uh, one of our first examples comes from Washington State. Um, since the state passed its complete streets policy in 2015, 98 cities and counties have adopted complete street ordinances as of September 2018. While the 2015 legislation committed $3.1 million in funding for 2015, and $14.7 million in future biennia, the funding for the local complete streets implementation is not codified and therefore must be funded during uh, the state's budget cycle process. The example you see here is from the city of Grandview in Yakima County. Uh, uh, Grandview is a rather small city in Yakima County with a population of approximately 11,000 individuals. And there was growing recognition in this community that the main roadway needed to be changed to be more pedestrian friendly. As you can see in the before and after pictures here on the right, the new street is more welcoming, adds lush greenery, and established safety protection so pedestrians could enjoy the downtown area. Since the project was completed, existing businesses have experienced growth, and seven new businesses have been established. This is an important point that we like to emphasize when talking about the cost implications of complete streets policies. While local and state governments might not see a direct return on investment in a single year, the impact of these policies can spur economic growth and generate additional revenue through other means. Uh, 
Um, this slide here is uh, really meant to emphasize the importance of multi-sector engagements when advocating for and implementing complete street policies. Um, this second example highlights the work of the Baton Rouge Sustainable Transportation Action Committee, or STAC. Um, this first slide here is going to provide some background, and the second one will go um, in a little more detail in terms of the process they went through during their pilot project. Um, as you can see on the slide, uh, STAC is uh, a partnership between the Center for Planning Excellence and AARP Louisiana. So again, thinking about this, a planning organization would make sense for um, the, um, to be the lead in looking to uh, enact and implement a complete streets policies. Um, but uh, having an innovative partner such as AARP Louisiana um, really helped bring other folks to the table. Additionally, other partners included Catholic, Chari uh, Catholic Charities of uh, the Diocese of Baton Rouge, the Baton Rouge Area Chamber, and this is one area um, that I would like to emphasize is engagement with the business community and driving home some of uh, the points that I made on the previous slide regarding some of the economic benefits to uh, complete street policies. Additionally, there were um, regional medical centers involved, the American Heart Association, Louisiana State University, Bike Baton Rouge, and multiple civic associations, planning commissions, development districts, and local policymakers. So as STAC was evaluating their own process, they highlighted seven key elements of success as seen in the graphic on the right side of this slide. But I would like to emphasize three of these elements, especially as we are about to discuss how public health can be supportive and trusting partner in the implementation of complete streets policies. So the first point that I would like to highlight is data. So one thing that STAC did is they paired transportation and health data to identify areas of high need. So as we've seen in the previous presentations, we're able to identify specific counties or even um, uh, at a local level where there may be higher obesity rates, where there may be a lack of fresh food, and being able to pair this with transportation data can be incredibly helpful when planning and implementing a complete streets policy. On collaboration, as I mentioned in the last slide, um, the STAC convened local departments of transportation, the planning commission, state agencies, um, council members, and local stakeholders to establish their priorities. Um, this type of collaboration is incredibly important as you do need this type of grassroots support in order to ensure that the complete streets policy is um, uh, accepted widely and that you have more advocates for it on the ground. And then finally, um, community outreach. So again, this is really emphasizing the importance of grassroots support for complete streets policies. I think it's very easy for policymakers or advocacy organizations or some of these other stakeholders to identify that there is a need for a specific policy. However, there is not always the opportunity for community members to be able to have their input heard. And so having a very um, specific request from the community and really engaging them strategically is a very important aspect of being able to have an effective implementation of a complete streets program. Um, and finally, um, what I wanted to highlight here is that public health can be a really terrific partner and play a contributing role um, in the complete streets policy um, process. And so reflecting on the three key aspects from the stack, the stack example that I just went over, um, we can talk a little more about what public health can bring to the table here. So public health stakeholders can play a key role in the design and evaluation of complete streets initiatives. So public health for decades has led many data analysis and evaluation efforts. They bring a lot of expertise in this area and not only that, but they also bring a lot of unique data insights that they can bring to the table. So thinking about what are the types of health impacts that you do want to address with the development of a complete streets policies. Additionally, public health has specialization in equity, health, and physical activity. 
So again, thinking about not only what is a way in which that we can ensure that the um, streets are safer for pedestrians to walk on or for other modes of transportation to be utilized other than automobiles, but also thinking about what may be some of the long-term health impacts of these policies and is, is that another mechanism for which that you can advocate for the adoption of these policies. And finally, as uh, similar to the SAC, the SAC example, a public health is often seen as a neutral convener and has significant experience in coalition building. Um, additionally, um, public health, uh, often which is funded through the federal government and the CDC, can provide technical assistance to communities, whether that's related to the, the data analysis and evaluation that I discussed before, or perhaps being able to um, bring new insights to the table. And finally, um, public health is often um, engaged directly with the community, so whether that is with a clinic itself um, or um, having public health nurses out in the field uh, the public health departments and other stakeholders are, are really ones that understand their community and um, can really bring those type of insights and also have that organic voice at the table. Um, so I have a, a, a few graphics here to the right, and I'll just quickly walk through what was the role of public health in the development of the complete streets policies in these five unique communities. Um, so the, the first community we highlight here is Birmingham, Alabama, and a county-level health coalition supported the formation of a separate coalition specifically work to work on complete street initiatives in Birmingham. So again, this is all about thinking about what, how can we adapt um, already formed coalitions to shift towards these other policies that may not be seen as directly healthcare related, but have significant impacts on health. In Central Falls, Rhode Island, the State Department of Health provided technical assistance and support to the Mun Municipal Planning and Economic Development Department. So again, thinking about what, what are the type of expertise and assets the public health can bring to the table to assist with these efforts. Um, in Cleveland, Ohio, the, mun the Municipal uh, Health Department co-led the Complete Streets process in partnership with the Municipal Planning Department. So think about how can you leverage re resources across different apartment departments and ensure that you have all representation and viewpoints um, at the table. Um, and finally, um, I'll highlight uh, New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, where the Municipal Health Department partnered with advocacy groups and the Planning Department to implement the Complete Streets Initiative. So this is something that's really important in terms of how do you best engage with advocacy groups or other community-based organizations um, on this topic. And public health has significant experience doing this, and so we see public health as being a great partner to uh, transportation agencies, to planning agencies and departments, and to MPOs, and to really help facilitate and support the effective implementation of Complete Streets policies. Um, so on this slide, we do have um, both Daphne and my contact information, in addition to links to our respective reports. Um, the other thing that I will highlight that is not on this slide is that um, for the 13 policies, including Complete Streets, um, that you saw in the beginning of my presentation, uh, we are working with the Center for Public Health Law Research out of Temple University to do a full legal analysis for all 50 states in the Washington, D.C. Um, on these policies. And so um, this will be published uh, by April of next year, and it will include detailed information on which states have adopted complete streets policies and what are the spe specific components within that legislation and subsequent statutes um, that may be relevant for comparisons. And so we see this as a tremendous resource that advocates, decision makers, um, and uh, agency representatives can utilize to look and compare either their own policies to other states or to look as a, a, a way in which that they can follow other states' lead in this area. Um, and with that, I believe we are on the question and answer portion. 
Thank you so much, Adam uh, and Daphne, for sharing that important information. Um, really interesting. We have some time now for questions, and we've been getting some questions. Uh, if you'd like to submit a question, please be sure to type it in the chat box in the, le the bottom left corner of your screen. So we'll go ahead and get started and see how many of these questions we can address. Uh, the first question we have here is, how can I advocate for policies at my local level to promote the upstream solutions you discussed? And I'll just jump in and then I'll, I'll allow both Daphne and, and Adam to add anything additional. But I would say um, from SGA's perspective and the National Complete Streets Coalition, we would encourage you to connect with your local bike or pedestrian advocacy groups. And you know, there's local advocates working throughout the country that could you know, help harness that energy and push that, uh, push that work upstream as, as asked. I don't know if Daphne or Adam have anything to say on that one. Adam, do you want to go? Uh, or? Yeah, I, I can hop in here. I mean, I, I think one thing that's important, especially if you're, you're looking across a diverse set of policies, is to really recognize what are the needs in your communities. And often, this type of information is publicly available. So whether it's through your own local or state health department, or it's through um, external resources such as county health rankings and roadmaps, being able to identify what are the specific needs, and then from there, uh, really uh, hit on the policies that can best address those. I think it it's often can be a, a difficult conversation either at the local, state, or national level to try and convince folks that there are these health improving policies that aren't related to the healthcare system at all. It doesn't have to do with healthcare payment. It doesn't have to do with healthcare delivery or setting foot in a provider's office or a hospital. But there are, there are these opportunities available for communities to address um, the health issues that they're dealing with um, through policy change. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, we can move on to the next question. Uh, is there a way I can support policy change at the national level without being in Washington, D.C.? And as far as Complete Streets is concerned, there definitely is a way. Please let your representatives know that you support the Complete Streets Act of 2019, which is the federal funding program to build Complete Street networks throughout the country. And we are happy to follow up after this webinar uh, on how to do that, and we'll include that information in our, our follow-up. I'm not sure. The only thing, Emily, Emily, the yeah. only thing I would add to that too, which I think is, you know, obviously is using Smart Growth America as a super important resource, is um, even though you're not in D.C., your senators and your representatives are back home quite often. They're usually home most of December. They're usually home all of August, um, and those are really great times to meet with them one-on-one, -on -one, um, either, either scheduling a meeting or going to their town halls. You can get that information by calling their local office, um, and all of their phone numbers, you just go to their website, and it's usually at the bottom of the page. Um, members of Congress love photo ops, so if there is a photo op, um, that you can provide, whether it's them wearing a hard hat or them talking to kids or something, you can sometimes get them to your events as well where you can talk to them about the importance of the issues that you're working on as well. That's great. That's really great specific strategies. Thank you, Daphne. If there's nothing else on that question, then I think this one was specific uh, to the presentation by Adam. And the question is, where is the cost information for complete streets that you presented coming from? What are the, what are the sources? I think this was when you uh, you said the cost per foot of asphalt versus um, for sidewalks versus uh, bike lanes, et cetera. Yes, um, I'm trying to track down the specific sources of that now. Um, what I would recommend is that um, you can um, re our, our report does have those references in there, um, but th but they're all multiple sources available that do highlight this. I think for um, complete streets, as as I cited, um, we did utilize a lot of resources from SGA. It may not be those cost components, 
um, but we are also able to obtain some of the cost information from county health rankings and roadmaps, and uh, all of that information is cited in our report. Great, and we have time for one more question, which I think is specific to co complete the National Complete Streets Coalition, which is what are some of the mandatory requirements in the, in the 29 states in D.C. that have adopted Complete Streets policies? Um, and the, the truth is because each community and state is unique, each state's Complete Streets policy is different. Um, However, as a coalition, we do have a framework for what makes a strong Complete Streets policy, and we use that to grade policies each year. And you can find more information on those annual reports on our website, and we, again, will include that in the follow-up email after this webinar. And uh, unless Daphne and Adam have anything else to add, I'll go ahead and start wrapping up. Uh, Emily, I would just like to give a plug for your own resource that we found incredibly helpful, which is the elements of a complete streets policy. Um, and from that, we're going to um, really try and uh, operationalize that in order to capture the different components of uh, state statutes across the country. Thank you for that plug. We appreciate it. And with that, um, you know, I want to thank everybody for your time. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get to all of the questions, um, but the Complete Street team will be publishing a follow-up blog post with answers to the questions that we weren't able to cover at this time. It will also include a recording and the slides from the webinar, so please look for that on our website next week. And I want to thank again Daphne and Adam for joining us today. We enjoyed hearing about the awesome work that you are doing and look forward to your following projects in the future. And to everyone who has joined us today, thank you again. Make sure to tune in on Thursday, January 30th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for our next webinar, Equitable Complete Street Principles in Safe Routes to School. And from the whole National Complete Street team, thank you very much, and I hope everyone has a great day.